Thank you, Brian. You're welcome to just hang up here until uh, we're there. Uh, need some help. So uh, my usher greeter people, if you can pass out communion for me, that would be really, really helpful. And uh, while we're doing that, did anybody, did anybody had that experience where somebody says something about you that you hadn't really picked up on before? Am I the only one? Yeah, okay. All right. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I had a guy tell me that I looked like Dennis Quaid. And first I thought he said Randy Quaid, and I was like, oh man, that's, <laughs> that's just a bummer. But then I figured out I've never had that before. So anyway, I guess that's a good thing, right? I'll, I'll take that. Uh, really glad you're here today. Just to reiterate, uh, Tuesday, if you want to come uh, to my group, we rehash stuff, go a little deeper than I do on uh, Sunday, uh, let you mess around with it a little bit, ask anything. Uh, Tuesday nights are probably going to come back. I've gotten some pretty good response. If you would want to attend that, I need to know from you so I know when to make that happen. And also, I put out a feeler to see if we want to resurrect our early service on Sunday. And the response has been pretty good, so uh, I'll let you know uh, what that's looking like and when, uh, but pretty likely that's going to come. I want to let you know part of what we're thinking with that in terms of our timing, because it's a little different. We're asking the question 8.30, 8.45, or 9. We want to make it at a convenient time for people who are purposely wanting that time slot. The feedback we get is they can get it here and then on with the rest of their day, which I respect that. Uh, but we also want some kind of opportunity for you to mingle uh, with everybody else. So uh, we're trying to time it right so that just as you're releasing, you can meet the people who are coming in for this service and, and whatnot. So anyway, that's coming. So today I want to do communion with you up front as part of our meditation. And so I'm going to read some scripture for you, read a couple of quotes from uh, the book we're going through, and then the teaching will kind of pick up where communion leaves off. I like what uh, Epperly says here in this particular quote. It says, Prayer is bigger than our uttered words. Whereas once spirituality was seen as an escape from the world, often taking us away from embodiment and the hard scrabble world of politics and economics, today many people see the spiritual journey as holistic in nature, embracing body, mind, spirit, relationships, and the planet. We are all, as Thomas Merton notes, guilty bystanders who are called by God to immerse ourselves in global transformation as part of our spiritual journeys. In other words, this whole spiritual thing that we do is really our life. We, don't, we do sometimes use it to escape, but really it's our spirituality that takes us deeper into what life is supposed to be and make the world a better place. Well, there was a guy uh, who lived a very long time ago. His name was Elijah. He's one of the great prophets in the Old Testament. Um, well, probably the greatest prophet. If you don't count Moses, uh, he wasn't really a prophet. Elijah's the guy, followed closely by a guy named Elisha, his protege. And he lived at a time uh, when his skills were needed. Uh, the leadership in ancient Israel had gone amok. Uh, Queen Jezebel uh, was ruling the roost and uh, uh, supporting, uh, encouraging these prophets of Baal. Uh, and it's not that God is against other religious traditions as much as these prophets of Baal uh, included some other really horrific things, which included exploitation of people. So when you would go worship uh, with the prophets of Baal, uh, sometimes that would include um, uh, temple prostitutes. Sometimes those temp temple prostitutes would be women. Sometimes it would be children. So real people were getting hurt by this. Relationships were being destroyed in these practices. So that I, you can kind of understand why God would have a problem with this. Well, it reached ahead, and uh, there was a showdown. And Elijah uh, went up to the top of a mountain uh, all by himself, and he took on all of the prophets of Baal. And I won't go into that whole story. Uh, it's a little bit folklore, legend. We're not exactly sure what to make all of it. But the bottom line that the writers want to convey to us is, Elijah, with the power of God with him, won, decidedly, like no question whatsoever. Also, because it was back in that time in history, they went ahead and slaughtered all the, all the prophets of Baal. <laughs> so it's kind of a PG-13 slash rated R film because in antiquity, that's just the violence that existed. So Elijah's feeling on top of the world until he hears that Queen Jezebel was not happy with how this showdown went. 
and she put a price on his head and said, I'm going to take this guy out myself or probably with hired guns. At this point, just remember, Elijah just saw God do this incredible work taking on all these prophets. You would think at that moment he'd puff up his chest a little bit and just be like, well, bring it on because I think God can handle even you, Queen Jezebel. But he didn't. He cowered and he ran. And that night when he stopped running, he went to bed and there was an angel of God that somehow mysteriously came, told him to eat. He ate a little bit, went to sleep a little bit, took a nap as we all do after we've had a nice meal. <laughs> the angel wakes him up, says, eat some more because you're going to need this for the journey. Elijah runs 40 days and 40 nights, which is a biblical way of saying a long time. He runs all the way to Mount Sinai. So you have kind of Jerusalem, which is in Israel, Middle East. Mount Sinai is in Egypt. So he runs all the way down there to go to the top of Mount Sinai, Sinai because he wants to find himself in the presence of God. Sometimes people will go to great lengths <laughs> to put themselves in the presence of God. So he did. He's running for his life. This was where the law was given, and he thought, if I'm going to get the protection of God anywhere, it's going to be here. And so he hears the presence of God or the voice of God say this to him. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks... Did I give you this text? Oh, there it is. Thank you. Uh, it was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. This, by the way, um, is where we get earth, wind, and fire. Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember the 21st of September? Yeah, I, did. I digress. All right. Sorry, couldn't help myself. All right. I'm an Earth, Wind, and Fire fan. So after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. Actually, in the Hebrew, it is the sound of silence. Hello, darkness. My <laughs> I, just, I just can't help it. All right. So <laughs> after the fire, there was the sound of silence. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And so I would want to ask you the same question. What are you doing here today? Because my hunch is, is that you came here today in some way to be in the presence of God in community, maybe learn some things, Maybe it was the free donuts and coffee, but you came here expecting something. And I wonder what drove you here today. And my guess is that for some of you, it's just your routine. It's just part of your rhythm of life, and that's a very good thing uh, to incorporate community worship together because of so many reasons. You are a happier, more positive person just for showing up. That's the data. But I'm guessing that some of you may be here for other reasons as well. Maybe fear is one of them. And maybe life has dealt you a pretty tough hand and you're having to play that hand or it's being played on you and it's difficult. Maybe you have deep questions that you're just longing to get answered. Maybe you're just feeling hopeless. All kinds of things lead us to want to come into this space. Why are you here today? Why are you here today? The good news is, is God continues to show up, and God continues to show up even in the silence, which is why we incorporate meditation into our services, because our world is noisy. And for some of you, the meditation that we do here at Crosswalk every week is the only time in your life <laughs> when you stop. You stop talking. You stop listening to music or Netflix or whatever. You're forced or invited to just be still. So before we jump into communion, which is related to this stuff, just want to be still for just a moment. So just take a deep breath. 
Close your eyes if that helps. There's the sound of the fan. That might actually help you. A little white noise for you. This is a safe space. And you are welcome here. But it helps to know why we're here. What are you hoping for today? So God, as we linger in this moment of breath, of stillness, we invite you to come alongside to remind us that you're here. Take just two or three breaths in silence. So the disciples didn't know to be afraid the night that Jesus was arrested. You can open your eyes now. We're going to transition into communion here. But it was the night that Jesus was betrayed that he introduced uh, this bread and cup idea. And while the church historically and classic Christianity has really taken this image and made it all about a very good thing, which is that we're loved and forgiven by God for all the stuff that we've messed up in our personal lives and in the world, um, this one thing, the bread and the cup, have globally uh, been communicated to us that that sin, that you don't have to worry about it. It's wiped out. And that's good news. But the night that Jesus was with his disciples, that's not what he said this was about. As good as that is. So I want you to know, first of all, that's, that's really your freebie today, is just to be reminded that you are deeply loved by God. And whatever stuff you think you've done that would keep God from you, that's done. It's over. Jesus communicated again and again and again to all walks of life in his ministry that the grace of God is freely given. So the restart button, the reset button happens all the time. So take comfort in that. This really is a safe space. But what Jesus said to them when he gave them this, he said, I want you to remember me. I just want you to remember me. And the reason why he wanted us to remember him is because he's speaking to his disciples who are going to pick up the mantle that he was to leave behind. And the only way they're going to continue doing the work of Jesus is if they remembered the work of Jesus. Later on, that very night, before Jesus is uh, arrested, uh, the Gospel of John gives us a whole chapter of Jesus' prayer. If you want to know what was on Jesus' mind, read John 17. You know what the gist of his prayer was? God, I know my time has come, and I'm just asking that you protect my followers and that they become one with you like you and I are one. He's asking the disciples to remember him, and then he's saying in his prayer, I want my disciples to be one like you and I are. You know what these things mean? This invitation to follow Jesus and then saying, remember me, and then saying to, uh, to Abba, I want them to be one with you, it means that it's possible. It means that it's possible that the things that Jesus did, he really wants you to do. And it means you can do them. It means that the unity that Jesus had with God that he wants for his followers is possible for you. And that's what this is about. So we take the cracker and we remember that Jesus was flesh and blood just like you and me. Take it and remember Jesus' body. was flesh and blood, just like you, 
and just like me. Yet before most people realized the fullness of what he tapped into, he also recognized that there was something else coursing through his veins. Not just blood, but the very presence of God. This is true for you as well. This is true for you as well. The Spirit of God is in you, with you, for you, to help you remember and to help you be so much like Jesus. Take and drink. One more quote, and then we have a song for you to sing, along with uh, Brian. It's a question about how big is your soul. I love that, that chapter that he had for one of our days. And Bruce Epperly, Epperly says, Today we need persons of stature, extravagant-spirited persons who can embrace political, economic, ethnic, and racial diversity in our increasingly polarizing age, because Jesus did. We need to have the largeness of soul to treat our opponents with the same care as we give to those for whom we advocate. We need to commit ourselves to constantly enlarging our spirits so that no person is foreign and every place is our spiritual home. Now, you, Brian? All right, so today I got something a little special for you, and I wanted to break up some things from communion and the teaching um, because I didn't want to dilute one or the other. So I hope that uh, your experience of communion was good and part of what you're here for and what's happening for you today. Uh, but this next piece is a little different. And just to remind you, we're uh, doing this uh, quantum-informed prayer thing. I'll have some more sciencey stuff for you in the weeks ahead, uh, some fascinating things, a uh, cool little experiment we're going to do here, which should be kind of cool that has to do with energy, uh, which will be fun. Um, and really what we're trying to do is get away from this paradigm of God where God is up there somewhere, so we're praying to a God up there uh, to do things for us down here, to break in. And what we're saying theologically is that's the wrong paradigm because God has never been up there anywhere, even though we think about God in the heavens up there. God has always been everywhere, all the time. Fancy $20 word for that is panentheism, everything in God. And that's, uh, I think that's a biblical way to understand things. And you see that reflected in the Bible, even as you hear them using antiquated language uh, from a Ptolemaic era where God is still up there. So that's where we're trying to go today, and I got an interesting twist for you. But I like this idea of, uh, of the how large is your soul. And if you read the stuff this week, you came across this quote on having a fat soul, which I thought was just great. A fat soul, a beautiful soul is a large soul, one that can overcome the smallness and pettiness of our human condition. A really fat soul can welcome diverse people, ideas, and ways of being in the world without feeling threatened. A fat soul experiences the intensity of life in its fullness, even the painful side of life, and knows there is something still bigger. Another quote related to this on uh, how do you develop a fatter soul, and it has to do with a rich spirituality. And Jay McDaniel writes, By spirituality, I mean openness to God's breathing, day by day, moment by moment, relative to the circumstances at hand. Understood in this way, spirituality is not supernatural or extraordinary, but deeply natural and wholly ordinary. It can be embodied at home and at the workplace, while alone with and with others, amid dishwashing and diaper changing, laughing and crying, living and dying. There was a monk from centuries ago, his name was Brother Lawrence, and he uh, had some great writings, and one of the things that was so profound about what he wrote about was uh, that he felt closer to God while he was cooking food or washing dishes for the monastery than he did in the formal times of prayer uh, with his fellow monks. Uh, there's a good book in a modern English translation called Closer Than a Brother. I highly recommend it just to get inside his head. That was one of those uh, early books in my life that just helped me rethink what is our walk with God really looking like. And it, it is meant to be an every day, every moment kind of adventure. This idea that, that 
every moment of our day is an opportunity for spiritual growth and for, for us to commune with God, to be nudged by God, wooed by God, is part and parcel of what I want to talk to you about today because I have a living, breathing story and example of how this plays out in real life. So uh, last Sunday, uh, we were encouraged, my wife and I, Lynn, were encouraged to uh, do the open studio uh, thing in Napa. Two weekends in a row, uh, you could go to different artists' uh, studios and see their setting and see their work, admire their stuff. I didn't get to Zaza's, uh, but hopefully uh, next year, uh, or I'll just come over to your place and bring a cup of coffee and you can show me your work, <laughs> which would be great. But we only had time for the one uh, last week, and uh, because Carrie Nuccio is my number one fan here at Crosswalk, the person we chose to go see is her daughter, uh, Carly Jesh. And uh, it was just delightful. It was a beautiful day, and she walked around uh, her backyard where she had her art displayed and uh, told us about the different series of artwork that she had and what went into them. Now, you have to know uh, that I have zero artistic ability uh, when it comes to painting or drawing. Zero. Uh, I'm, my stick figures are bad. That's, that's how bad I am, right? And unfortunately, my son, uh, who may be watching right now, he got the gene from me. So uh, when he was in high school, he was in an AP something or other class, and they had to do some artwork for it. And after he graduated, uh, my daughter was taking the same class, and the teacher brings out some work to give examples of, you know, how people could put together their portfolio. And she brings out this one and says, now here's a guy who had no artistic bone in his body, but he gave it a good solid effort and got an A, and it was Noah's. <laughs> so my, my daughter just starts cracking up, and her classmates knew him and all that. So it was pretty funny. So all that is to say that when I come across somebody who can do something artistic that I can't do, I can do other forms of art. I can sing. And I'm pretty good at it uh, some days. Uh, not here ever, but, <laughs> but in other settings, I could be pretty good at it. I'm pretty good at oration, speaking in public and that kind of a stuff, um, but not, not other forms. Uh, even within music, I played trombone and jazz bands in high school and college, but I could never do what Keith Reidenauer can do, where he just riffs and just goes. That's a whole different skill set. So I just admire so much when I come across people who can do stuff so skillfully. Ed Edwards had us an art class studio, or, or um, I'm not saying that right, but I'm thinking Edwards Art and Glass, that's right. Uh, and just fascinating about how he would layer things together and create stuff. Um, it just blew my mind. So when she's showing us around and talking about textures and layers and how she would use different media to create things, uh, it's just, I'm fascinated by it. And just so interesting to get inside of her head. Uh, so she showed us around some neighborhood ones that sort of reminded her of places and her and her husband, Charlie's uh, life, and worked around to some, some other spaces, walked us by these paintings, which she just lightly referred to as the Reepicheep series, which is what I'm going to talk about uh, today. Uh, Reepicheep is a character from a C.S. Lewis uh, novel, um, Prince Caspian, and a part of the Chronicles of Narnia series. And I'll talk more about that later, but, but the, the pictures were sort of these seascapes with some sailboats in them. And then we kept on going down, and we came across this other one uh, that was uh, also a seascape with three sailboats, and it was called Jordan. And it looks like this, and by the way, the art that I'm talking about today is on the back table, though. So after service, if you want to go admire her work up close, uh, you're welcome to do that. So uh, this is the one on the left, and then I'll work my way uh, through these. But just something about this, I, I just really liked the colors. I liked, I grew up on Lake Michigan, and so uh, I love sailing. I've only been a few times, but I admire it, and it's, it's just, it speaks kind of what she wanted to do with her, uh, with her sailboats. It, it speaks about journey. And so she incorporated these in four particular pieces of work. And the more she talked about this painting, uh, the more I liked it. Um, this was one of the paintings that, uh, that she did early on after she'd put up her brush for a long time. Uh, she'd had some uh, sort of life struggles with some things, which she shares about later, which I'll share with you with her permission, uh, just briefly. Um, but that kind of period of her life kind of made it difficult for her to do her art. So this piece of art right here before you and back there 
It was like the beginning of her art, artistry coming back to life again. It's really rich. I loved, I loved the colors. I loved the sunset. I loved uh, the, the sailboats. And as I looked at it, knowing that we'd just been past these other paintings, uh, which she calls Ripacheep, um, I was curious, why, why isn't this one with those? Because there are such similarities. And she didn't really know what to say to that. But later on, she started to wonder if this was an unknown precursor to the other two. Like she did this one, and then that theme kind of bubbled up again uh, later. Well, I want to get you inside uh, the Reaper Cheap thing. So she gives this quote, uh, this is on her website. In C.S. Lewis's series, The Chronicles of Narnia, Reaper Cheap is a mouse, petite in size, yet bounding with courage and faithfulness. His whole life, he dreams of Aslan's country. Aslan is a figure for God in this, in this book, in this series. Uh, he dreams of Aslan's country where sky and water meet and carries with him the hope he will see it one day. I have often connected with the character of Reepicheep, feeling small yet driven to continue on. I have consistently been emotionally moved by the moment when he first realizes that he has, in fact, arrived. When I created the first piece in this series, not this one, uh, but one I'll come to next, I was not thinking of this small creature, but simply playing with the idea of a colorful clouded sky and moving ocean water, enjoying the fact that I wasn't entirely sure myself where one ended and the other began. Once I realized this was reminiscent of Reepicheep's story, I chose his name as the title for the series I wanted to create. Each of the newer pieces included at least one metallic ship, the ships allude to the theme of journey, while the metallic coloring gives a hint of something richer, something beyond. And so the first one she named Jordan. And by the way, um, I learned that how she comes up with the names of her paintings uh, is from works of fiction, uh, because she figures that way she'll never run out of names for her paintings, because there's <laughs> lots of books and she's an avid reader. And so this one was named for some Jordan and some book that she read. And then the, the first one that she actually did that she landed as a Reepicheep thing, she called it Jonah, not the Bible Jonah, but, but Jonah from some book uh, that she read. And so you can see the, the sailing ships there, and the blue uh, represents uh, the water and the sky above. And that golden area is sort of, sort of that presence of Aslan, that God's area, that gold kind of represents that majesty uh, that's there. And then the final one uh, that she did in the series... Um, at that time was called Henry. And there's a special story behind this one that we'll get to. This one really leans into that theme where you're not quite sure where the sky is and where the sea is. They all just kind of blend into each other. And this one is, uh, is pretty rich. And just to kind of show you where this is going, she's naming the next one in the series Reepicheep 1. And the one after that is Reepicheep 2. And you kind of get that same theme. So all these are back there uh, for you to see them. And this is what they look like all together. So you have Jordan and Jonah, Henry and Reepicheep. Uh, as I was thinking about these, and in conversation with, uh, with Carly, um, we talked about how art is highly interpretive. Uh, she talked about when she was creating these, it's almost like she's having a dialogue with the art itself. Like somehow the painting is wooing her to take the next stroke or to go in this next direction. She can't really pinpoint it, but she just keeps working at it and redoing some things from time to time. And then at some point, she feels like it's nearly done. She said that Reap a Cheap One is nearly done and the others obviously are complete. I thought, thought that was fascinating. But then she also talked about how uh, even though that's her interpretation of these paintings, that the observer also has their own experience of the painting and can see things maybe that the artist didn't even intend but are really, really there. This is, uh, by the way, what, what postmodern thought uh, is all about. Postmodernity well, came after modernity, and modernity was all about this is the answer, this is what Carly mean, and there's no discussion about. Well, postmodern thought, which really was born from architecture and from literature, poses this idea 
that maybe the one who's doing the craft or the art, they have their take on it, but maybe, that's, maybe there are things about their own art, be it a painting, be it glass, or be it writing, that the artists themselves don't even know are bubbling up. And so therefore, the critics, the readers, those who appreciate it, can speak into it and wonder, just like I did with her, about the one that I bought. I bought that Jonah painting uh, because it moved me so much. And I told her why, and she'd never thought about a connection between Jordan and these other three, even though it's three boats and you can see uh, the similarity uh, with them, the golds and blues and, and all that. And so she was very game to talk about interpret interpretive, yeah, interpretative, is that right? Am I getting that yet? <laughs> uh, uh, our capacity to interpret on our own and even suggest things that maybe she didn't intend but are there nonetheless. That's why I wanted your question today to be, has anybody told you anything about yourself that was news to you. And that has been true for me in my life, uh, news to me about things that I do that my dad you know, did, phrases I would say, or a laugh, or a look, or a, a, way, a twinkle in my eye like my mom would have, these kinds of things. I think we all get these, and we don't know it until somebody tells us, oh yeah, that sounds just like your dad, and you didn't know that. Well, there are things that I want to take some creative liberty with, with this artwork, because the more I thought about it, I just couldn't let it go. And I recognize that not only is this a postmodern example of how I, as the, the viewer, uh, have the opportunity to, to look at art and see something and wonder about things that maybe she didn't intend, I also believe that in our our way of thinking theologically, which is a process way of thinking, where God is interacting with us all the time, never controlling, never coercing, but constantly luring and inviting and wooing us, that I started to wonder, just as I am beginning to imagine, you know, and see some things in here of depth, maybe that could be God wooing something in me. Hey, look at this, Pete. Check this out. And maybe... Maybe that even while she was randomly selecting names for her paintings, that even if she didn't have the same idea in mind, could it be that God was working in her as well to give us the names of the paintings that we have today? So let me tell you what I saw, more than I have already. Jordan. Well, my first question about the naming, she, she assured me she was not thinking about the River Jordan, uh, which is a border river uh, in the nation of Israel, right next to the country of Jordan. Uh, that, that all makes sense. When I think of Jordan, though, I can't help but think of water because we're seeing a water scene, but that's clearly not a river. That's like an ocean or a great lake or something like that. But I wasn't thinking so much about the lake or the river Jordan as I was about what that river represented uh, for ancient Hebrews and people in Jesus' time. The ancient Hebrews, um, most people when they hear the word Hebrews, is another way of thinking about uh, uh, the Jewish people, uh, they immediately go to a geographical location, Hebron. And they assume that the word or the name Hebrews uh, comes and is a descriptor of the people who are from Hebron. Well, that is one rendering of the word Hebrews that we have. But many years ago, I came across another rendering, which just blew my mind and was so much more beautiful than just simply calling out a geographical location. And in the ancient Hebrew language, that word Hebrew can be, uh, can be defined as the ones who cross over the ones who cross over. And if you think about that from the Hebrew uh, history, the Jewish history, they're the ones who crossed over. When they were uh, in bondage in, in Egypt, they crossed over through the Red Sea. When it came time for them to finally, so many years later, to cross into the Promised Land, they crossed over the Jordan. The Hebrew people were crossover people. And that crossoverness required great faith. The Hebrew people are a people of faith to take the first step into what shouldn't be happening, and they do it anyway, crossing over from one theological image of God 
discovering their own understanding of God and a monotheism that was pretty rare at that time in history. It's remarkable. Later on in the history, uh, this shows up with Elijah's protege, uh, Elisha. There was a guy named uh, Naaman who was a, a military leader. And he had leprosy, and he heard that maybe Elisha and Israel could help. And so Elisha wouldn't even meet him. He just sends his servant down to tell Naaman, go wash in the River Jordan seven times. He's telling a military commander to take seven baths in a row. And the military leader was indignant. How dare you insult me so much? I could have just stayed home and taken baths. And he just about leaves, and then the servant who was there to inform him said, you know, he came all this way. You know, the worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to get squeaky clean. Why not give it a shot? And so, time after time, baptism after baptism, after the seventh time, he comes out and the leprosy is gone. Centuries later, we have John the Baptist. And what is he doing? He's inviting people to prepare themselves for what God is going to do, to take a step in faith, to get yourselves cleaned up. And that the action that he uses for that is baptisms in the water Jordan. That is a crossover move of saying, I have been living my life in this way, but I see a new way, and I want to enter in. I want to get that, the old way cleaned off, and I want to emerge new and fresh. That's part of what baptism is all about. Crossover. And I just thought about Carly and how in her struggle, uh, which you'll see alluded to in a minute with OCD, um, this had to have taken Herculean courage to pick this up again when things in her were saying, don't bother, don't bother, it's too much, it's too hard. And yet she chose to cross over into her art again, into creativity again. It was a new beginning for her. And I just found that beautiful. And then, of course, the next one we have is Jonah. And uh, what I like about this Jonah uh, image uh, is that you have the golden area, which again, I think is uh, kind of reminiscent of the heavenly golden space. And uh, the, the ships are going to the right, where the heavenly part is going to run out. And I thought, I wonder what those ships are doing. I wonder where they're going after. Maybe Jonah is on one of those ships, you know, from the Bible story. He's on his way away from what God wants him to do. Or maybe this is the presence of God that's chasing Jonah, <laughs> who's running away from the very presence of God. Either way, I don't want to spend too much time on that, but, but that kind of, I just kind of, I thought it was interesting that in that particular picture, she chose to call that Jonah. The one where she's beginning this whole chapter in her painting life again. She called Jordan a crossover type thing, a new beginnings kind of a thing. And here she chooses out of all the names that she could pick and all the literature she's read, she picks Jordan. And the next one with Jonah, all of the names that she possibly could have picked and she ends up landing feeling like she wants to call this one Jonah. And so I was feeling pretty good about it until I figured out what the name of the next one was. Henry. I'm like, Henry, <laughs> I've read the Bible an awful lot. I don't remember any Henrys. I don't remember any Hanks <laughs> in the Bible at all. Uh, but I knew that that particular one, she said, had great meaning to her. And so uh, she wrote me uh, about this, uh, and I wanted to share it with you about Henry. Uh, this is, in her mind, the clearest of the examples of Reap a Cheap's vision, where there's not a clear line on the horizon separating sea from sky. And she talks about why this is important to her. Henry, the painting, is extra important to me because the character is from the book I was reading when my grandpa Fred was passing. It's also important because foster care was another thing that called to me before I heard it. I had been wanting to name a painting after Henry for a long time, um, uh, a long time character, a fictional child placed in foster care from the book Chicken Boy. But my OCD wouldn't let me. The book was contaminated in my mind because of a joke another character made about selling his soul to the devil by joining an HOA. Anyways, the moment I had the strength to name a painting Henry was meaningful for me in my journey. And it was afterwards that the painting made me think of Reepicheep. So this painting of Henry, that's the second to the last there on the right, the third one. That was the painting she was working on that she was interacting with when her grandpa uh, was starting to fade and passed. 
That was the painting that uh, helped her take a major step forward in her battle, her struggle uh, with obsessive compulsive disorder. So I thought, man, there's got to be something here. Because that's, I mean, all by itself, cathartic beauty. She's painting, you know, this heavenly scene of Aslan's country and all that. So I just did a little Google search on, on Henry. What's the origin of Henry? And did you know that Henry, uh, the English name Henry, is actually a play off the French name Henri. Oh, sorry, I didn't say that right. Ah, ah, Henri. There we go. <laughs> just having some fun. So anyway, uh, but it's not a French name either. It actually comes from uh, the German name Heimerich, which translates as the ruler of the house. Heimerich, which is where we get Henri, and where we get Henry means ruler of the house. But Henry in English translates it much more succinctly to just simply Lord. She's working with the Lord, working with Henry, while her beloved grandfather is nearing death. With her brush in dialogue with Henry, she's painting the scene that her grandfather is headed toward. And when she finally chooses to name the painting Henry, overcoming the fear and the stuff that is going on in her head that she cannot control, she calls on the name of the Lord and found at least a step of salvation. Henry. <laughs> if you could just feel an iota of what I'm feeling now and what I felt then, just to wonder. You know, I know. I'm, I'm the observer. She didn't mean any of this. But so what? You know how many times I've given a sermon and some people will come up to me and tell me I was speaking right to them and I'll say what? And they share something with me that I really wasn't talking about. Thank God for that. <laughs> right? I think this is a beautiful example of both postmodernity of the observer being able to see things that maybe the artist or the person who, the creator, did not see or even did not intend. And I also believe it's an example of this idea of a God in process with us, always helping us think, always helping us see, wooing us to see things. And I can't tell you how many people I've had conversation with who feel so distant and far from God, only to have me recount to them in detail the times when I've seen God at work in their lives. And how beautiful a thing to be able to say to somebody who feels so alone, they've never been alone. <laughs> Carly called on the name of the Lord and she found a step toward her healing. That's the real meaning of salvation. She called the painting Lord as her grandfather is dying, a painting of the heaven he would behold. I love it. This uh, quote came out of our reading this week, which is so rich. This is from Bernard Loomer. Every important revelation, every important incarnation carries with itself the principle of transcendence. Every revelation exists to be surpassed, and therefore every revelation contains within itself a pointing beyond itself. This is what process theology is all about. That things continue to create and create and create, motivated by the very Spirit of God. Uh, we'll say this prayer out loud uh, in a second, but the first thing I want to do is that bottom thing there. I breathe the Spirit deeply in and blow it gratefully out again. Just want you to look at that phrase and take a few deep breaths with me. This is something that uh, Bruce Epperly, the author of our book, was taught while he was in seminary, and it stuck with him all this time. 
And as you think about your life, about what you do, what you offer the world, maybe this could be your prayer. So just say it with me. I breathe the Spirit deeply in and blow it gratefully out again. I breathe the Spirit deeply in and blow it it gratefully out again. Before we read this benediction prayer, may you know that even what you do, even if it's not what you thought you were doing, you're still not alone in the game. There is another player constantly at work in your life who is constantly after shalom, after your well-being and the well-being of everybody, all the time, incessant. You can trust it. Your botched good intentions, you're not alone. There's another force at work to help things along. Your prayers matter because you're creating something and God does something with that creation. May you know you're not alone. May you know there's a bigger other that is always with you, that is doing things through you, some of which you know about. And some things you won't know for a very long time. And how wonderful and beautiful that is. Let's say this prayer out loud together. Creative wisdom, move me to action that heals the earth. Help me see your calling in my daily tasks and my responsibilities as a citizen. Give me faith to move the mountain of apathy and passivity. Help me find the peace that calms and empowers and trusts your loving power in all things. Amen. Hope you enjoyed today. It's a little twist. I enjoyed it, so I guess that's all that matters. Thanks for coming, and uh, check out the paintings in the back. Thank you, Carly, for loaning me your work.